just trying to help make sure that people can be successful with their pets. And especially from the beginning, because when you have a connection with an animal, um, you tend to care more about their wild counterparts. You tend to care more about the environment that they're from. And then you tend to take action towards conserving that. And so I think just allowing people the accessibility of making connections with animals that they otherwise wouldn't is really, really important. And so we've put a huge emphasis on education, again, so that people go home, have good, positive experience, be successful with their pets, and continue in the hobby and continue to care about, you know, the wild counterparts and and the environment that they came from. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Ashley and Andrew of ZooMed. I don't think ZooMed needs any introduction at this point. It's really one of the mainstay reptile brands in herpeticulture. It's actually been around for, I think, nearly 50 years at this point. It's like 45 or 46 years, which is really incredible. So in this episode, we discuss what got Andrew and Ashley into reptile keeping and what they do at ZooMed, how they got into working for ZooMed. But we also discuss the history of the brand, because I think for for many of us, we've just always known ZooMed to be ZooMed, but there, it's, like I said, since it's been around for nearly five decades, it has quite an interesting history, how it started, some of the first products it developed, and then how it actually got into the production of UV lamps. And we discuss the evolution of UV lighting, starting from those old T12 lights, the big, larger, thicker tubes, and how that's evolved over time, and, and how the spectral output has changed as new products have been developed. And that's one thing I will say to the listeners, for those who are listening on Spotify or Apple. There are a few sections in this podcast that you'll probably want to come back to the YouTube video because Andrew was nice enough to show us some spectral graphs, which we've seen on the podcast before with Dr. Francis Baines and whatnot. And and that's been a really helpful tool to help people understand lighting and, and what output is happening from these lamps. So if you are at any point just listening to the audio, you may be a little bit lost. I think it's probably only maybe five or six minutes cumulatively through the whole episode, but I definitely recommend coming back to the YouTube video. I'll make sure that's timestamped for you so you can easily find it. We discussed that, and of course, we talk about UV LED lighting as well. That's something that we've been critical on the podcast about before. I shouldn't say critical, but maybe skeptical and I don't even know if skeptical is a quite word, but cautious. I think that's the right word, cautious, because it is new tech and there has been some, I think, very valid hypothesis related to some of the issues that can happen through using just UV LED lighting, particularly the hypervitaminosis D3 that could potentially happen. So anyway, we discussed that. Andrew talks us through that as well as some new product launches and announces announcements that are happening live on this podcast, which I was super grateful for for both Ashley and Andrew to be willing to announce new products that has that was really, really fascinating. So it's all around a great conversation. Again, it's nice to talk to a brand that's been around for a, an incredibly long time and also were fundamental in bringing UV technology to the reptile hobby. And I mean, I don't think you could put a value on how incredible that has been for our, our hobby and just the life and the welfare of the animals that we keep. If you're looking for more information on this episode, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. If you'd like to support the podcast in any way, you can just share it on social media or give it a rating on Spotify or Apple or buy yourself an, an Animals at Home t-shirt at animalsathome.ca slash shop. If you do pick up a sweater or a shirt, $5 automatically does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this podcast. You can find affiliate links to their website in both the YouTube description and the show notes. And if you'd like to help produce the podcast monetarily, you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home. Essentially, all of that money that comes to me through there really does help to either pay for my time, the editing, the server space that I use to to, to host the podcast, editing software, equipment. The list continues to go on. It's not cheap to produce the podcast, and I do I have a ton of gratitude for everybody that does support through Patreon. I think that's it. Let's jump into this episode. Enjoy. Well, Ashley and Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us on. Thank you. I know everybody listening is obviously very familiar with ZooMed. We're going to get into a lot of uh, the different products and some history behind ZooMed and, and some other questions that I have. But first, I, I'm kind of just a quick background on you, on, on both of you, I think would be really helpful. So maybe you could answer you know, what got you into reptiles initially and then what you what you do at ZooMed. And maybe we'll start with Andrew. So my interest in reptiles probably started with uh, 
in like the mid nineties, I got uh, my first reptile was a little three toed box turtle, and uh, we, my my dad and I, made like a summer project out of building an outdoor pen for them, um, and yeah, that was just kind of like what got me hooked, I guess. Um, we we didn't have a UVB light for them, um, but in California, we had them outside probably eight plus months out of the year. So yeah, no no health consequences uh, because of you know not having that, but definitely something we were oblivious to at the time. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, that was uh, that was probably what started it. And then, like work wise, uh, before I worked at ZooMed, I worked at a biological supply company um, that was also in San Luis Obispo, and they had some reptiles um, there as well. Um, pretty pretty common ones like anoles and and things like that, um, and also uh, algaes and protists that were cultured and. Um, but they had a freshwater fish and marine section, but all the animals and you know, little organisms were sent to uh, colleges and like research facilities for uh, like your science classes. When you look at a planaria under the microscope and look at their little crossed eyes and things, this is like where those animals came from. So that really got me interested in um, kind of that line of work and transition to ZooMed. There's a lot of crossover uh, learning and uh, experience that went with it. And, yeah, here I am. It's been seven years in a in a couple of weeks, so it's it's gone by quick. Uh, wow. Yeah, I guess it's when it goes by fast when you're enjoying your work. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Awesome. And, and Ashley, what about yourself? Uh, I grew up loving reptiles and just you know chasing lizards around the yard and everything. And uh, probably when I was like in second or third grade, a friend of mine got a green iguana, and I just became completely obsessed and like all of my book reports and everything I did about iguanas and I bugged my parents for just what seemed like forever. I mean, years. And um, when I was 10, they got me one and um, the whole setup and everything. Um, And I have learned already that iguanas need UVB. So I'm going to age myself a little bit here. This was, I think I got her in like 95. I had an iguana light, um, 310, you know, like the old T12. My dad was an electrician and super, um, creative. And he would like, we built cages for her and stuff all the time. We're constantly upgrading. And, um, but I just really, she, I had her for 21 years. Um, wow. good long time. And she was so mean when I got her and <laughs> spent a lot of time getting whipped and scratched and everything. But, um, she became the friendliest thing and just really like my best friend um, for a long time, all through college and everything. And uh, yeah, so I worked in pet stores for a while um, in high school and in college. And I went to Moore Park College and got my degree in exotic animal training and management and managed their reptile collection there. Um taught the summer camp after I graduated. And so that's when I really started um, falling in love with education as well. And, you know, trying to like engage young people and, uh, and to get a better understanding of, of animals. Um, then after that, I wanted to move back to my home, um, you know, town at least. And uh, I'm lucky that I grew up right here. And uh, mm-hmm. the, the job opening for Animal Caretaker was here at ZooMed and uh, that was almost 15 years ago. So uh, I I took that on and um, have the jobs definitely evolved a lot. But yeah, I reptiles are amazing and and learning about them and trying to educate people about them and and how to keep them is just something that I've I've been passionate about for a long time. So really lucky to be here. Awesome. And then just for, for each of you, for as a, as a hobbyist, is there a particular group of species or, or type of reptile that you gravitate towards? Maybe Andrew, you can go first and then, and then Ashley. Um, so I know like reptiles are, are you know, our, our bread and butter, but we also have uh, amphibians and uh, freshwater fish here as well. So I've always been a sucker for newts. Um, we had a uh, red spotted newts at the job I worked at prior and I really, really like those guys. Um, here at ZooMed, we've got a few different varieties as well. Um, those are maybe one of my favorites. And then uh, reptile-wise, I'm yeah, still a sucker for box turtles. Like we have three toe box turtles here, and yeah, it's just very familiar. You know, re- reminds me of my first uh, reptile. So yeah, those are probably the animals that I 
yeah, gravitate towards. Yeah, it's always those early childhood experiences that sort of like pave the way. It's like you could find newts when you're a kid under some rocks and then forever you're going to be a newt guy. Yeah, very impressive. <laughs> and Ashley, what about you? I I still love iguanas. Um, and uh, But also every time I learn about something new, I feel like, oh my gosh. And I just like immerse myself in that and... And that becomes my favorite for the day, you know. But I, I go back to iguanas and I love um, box turtles also and and, and tortoises. So uh, I don't know. I kind of I kind of like them all. But um, right now at home, I keep some box turtles and uh, a handful of New Caledonian geckos. Awesome. Well, I, I think I mean, for, for most people listening, Zoomed is an ever-present brand as far as they're concerned. I mean, Zoomed's actually been around for nearly 50 years. So for almost, you know, most people keeping reptiles, it's been around for, well, I would say everybody who's been keeping reptiles has been around for the majority of their keeping experience. It's just one of those very early brands. I, I'm curious a little bit about the history of the brand because I know it, it sort of went through some name changes originally and it, it was not initially a product company. So maybe, Ashley, did you, or, or whoever has the most... Uh, knowledge of the history. Uh, could you just give us a brief history of, of, the, of Zoomed? Oh, sure. Um, so Gary Bagnall is the founder and the president. And he started the company as In Cold Blood, which is a reptile uh, wholesaler importer. And um, so it was a live animal company. So uh, Truman Capote uh, reference for their name. Uh-huh. And um, they changed the name to... Uh, Orange County, Orange Zoological. County Zoological Supply, uh, and then again to California Zoological Supply, and they were still dealing in live animals at the time. Um, he started. He was working with someone who was developing a vitamin product for, uh, actually, in conjunction with the San Diego Zoo for some turtles that had soft shells. He's the curator, he said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and that product ended up being Reptivite, which was our first product and released in 1984. And so uh, after that, um, he he ended up buying his uh, his partner out and uh, and moved on to doing just um, just products. And kind of the joke was this this Reptivite, you know, it's not gonna it's it's not gonna poop. It doesn't eat. It lets you go home on the weekends. You know, it's a completely different thing. You can still have fun with reptiles, but you don't necessarily like have to have your your livelihood be in in selling live animals. And so he's like, "Oh, I guess that's a that's a chance I could take." And so it's mm-hmm. um, it's worked out. <laughs> but it was just you know a small thing, um, very humble beginnings, and uh, and starting his garage. <laughs> yeah, in his garage, like most good things do, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. There's, I mean, a lot of, I think, breeders go through that experience where you realize your product eats away at your profits before you sell it. You know, if you have a box of vitamins, it just sits there and it's going to, you might have to pay storage space or something, but it's uh, maybe a little bit more productive as far as profits go. So so then, so I know the Reptivite was, was kind of the initial product. And then there's this weird phase and, I, I, you know, when you think about the earlier days, not even the early days, but sort of like, you know, 30 years ago, the reptile hob- hobby was still very new-ish and also very confused, I think. And there was, you know, like things like, you know, at the zoo, soft tel- or, you know, turtles with sh- soft shells and whatnot. And people, animals are dying of metabolic bone disease and nobody really knows why. And you're starting to see like, you know, black lights being used and realizing, okay, the sunlight is very powerful. So I'm just curious, h- how did they go from the vitamins to the, to the lighting? Because I, I can kind of see the the through line between those two things, but the, un, the sort of intellectual understanding of those two things are very different. Like to understand how to make a product and then, or like a, a vitamin and then understand how to create lighting. Those are not in the same Venn diagram, you know? So was, do you guys understand, know how, how that happened? And I'm not sure who, whoever wants to jump on that one can. Um, yeah, I think uh, like timeline wise, at least uh, we were, we were actually just chatting with Gary uh, yesterday about like, Hey, you know, run down, like, the, the start and lead up to this point, um, you know, where, where things went. And uh, he'd said that in, in 1988 or thereabouts was when the, the Zoomed name like uh, officially came about. And uh, the Iguana Light 310 was a product that he said was launched in 90, 93? 92 or 93. Mm-hmm. And that uh, the, the first year of having it out there, he's like, nobody bought it. Like nobody was convinced of, the benefit or usefulness of something like that. Um, it, uh, he said, yeah, sales were almost nothing for that, for that product at, at the start. And then he'd said that they, uh, 
the only other light at the time was like a, a vital light. Yeah, vital light. You've heard of vital light? No, what's vital light? Um, it was just it was another light. I think they sold them for birds and for plant growth. Oh, um, okay, so it was another okay. like fluorescent light. Um, but everybody sold vital light, and so he actually told us he went to a trade show. Um, after his first year, and he had all of these other manufacturers' lights, you know, that w- they they just stuck a reptile sticker on a box, you know, the fluorescent lights, and called it a reptile light. When he went with and, his first uh, UVB meter in hand to uh, <laughs> make the case. Yeah, so he went and he like took readings under the mall, and he said, "Hey, you know, go go buy a light, you know, and and bring it over here, and we'll test it." And um, the the one that he developed the. Um, the 310 was the only one that had UVB and people went, oh, kind of, wow, you know, and uh, and this is when he started working with Gary Ferguson, uh, right? Um, he said that that was definitely like getting mentioned from Gary Ferguson uh, was a, a huge like game changer and then, mm-hmm. uh, you know, kind of got the ball rolling as far as people like listening to that and having like meters that could qualify your, you know, your claims uh, for lamp being yeah. The, it was a. Uh, it was kind of cool actually getting to, like, dive into the, the very first products of this kind because um, it, it, we were able to. We have one of the lights here actually. If you want, I don't know if it'll even like fit on screen, but it's a. Uh, it's the first <laughs> iguana light three ten. It's like uh, I don't know if you can see the look. Oh on yeah, that one. it's got like so, that retro packaging. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. a, is that like a? Is that a four foot two? Or that's pretty long. Yeah, four foot T twelve. T twelve. So it's that got guy. it's the it's the the thick one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was um, yeah, it was up on our our manager's um like like desk area, and it had just been sitting there for a while, a while before we uh we were getting all of our yes equipment in order for this. We found a fixture, fired it up, and took a spectral reading of it too. So you can you can share that later if you like, but. Yeah, yeah, I would love to get into that because I, I want to get into kind of how these things have evolved. But I, I'm I'm curious about what was the was there a how did Gary realize that UV was needed? Was it was it something to do with the sun, seeing animals thrive in the sun, and then realizing this is something that we need to bring into captivity inside? From my understanding, yeah, that uh, animals that were kept outside, especially in climates where they could be kept outside, they were okay. But mm. if they didn't have access to that, and that was just the one component that they could figure out, like. They're not getting. They're not getting this, and and you know we weren't completely ignorant to different parts of uh you know different spectrums of the sun, um, but didn't really know exactly what that function was right away. But seeing like these animals that are living outside in Florida are fine, and then I set it up in my house, and my iguana you know failed to thrive, and um, metabolic bone disease, and and all of these other issues from it. Um, so let's try to fill in that missing component. Yeah, I imagine it would have been a really tough sell at the beginning because a and also it kind of sucks. Like I'm sure the the overhead of producing vitamins is probably pretty low compared to producing lighting. Like you have to go and find a, a company that's going to be able to build these for you and and put out ultraviolet rays that aren't going to fry the animal and all these things. There's probably research and whatnot, and then to to have people just go and buy like the Home Depot tube because it looks the same coming out of the bulb was probably pretty depressing. Yeah, definitely, definitely a hard sell. Like you're saying, nobody like. Emphasis on the nobody buying it for that first year. Yeah. But, um, and, and then how did... It, I guess people started purchasing it and then they're starting, people were starting to see results. Like, I'm trying to think how this ball started to roll into po- and, you know, people positively purchasing these, these lights. Um, yeah. Well, so by the time I got my iguana, this was in the literature, was that you needed to have a UVB light. So again, this was right. 90... Well, I probably started doing my research in like 93, 94... Um, my research, my book report, <laughs> that was seven years old. <laughs> but yeah, there's um, no Google. <laughs> uh, but I I recall, you know, um, reading that you need to have a UVB light and and the information that we knew. Now, a lot of the information that we knew at the time was also not right. You know, I remember that we were supposed to make a salad for your iguana every day and sprinkle um, worms or cat food on top of it as like a protein source and all these things that we know today are like, oh, wow, yeah, let's not do that anymore. But yeah. um, but there was information on there in using a UVB light and um, and specifically uh, the, the iguana light 310 was called out in the books that I was reading. Um, so... I think getting that um, those these papers published, uh, Gary Ferguson, um, 
I can't remember some of the other names that he said, but but people started like kind of taking note and going, oh wow, yeah, this this works. And uh, and then the people that wanted to do any reading and research um, went ahead with it. And I was really lucky again because I grew up here, and these the company was also here at the time. So um, I these products were available in my local pet store. It was a mm. different distribution system at the time, um, but I I had access to them from the very beginning. And uh, and I think just, you know, having that information start getting out there in books because the internet didn't, isn't a thing. Uh, yeah. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> in books and papers um, that uh, we were able to start, you know, distributing the information and making sure that people had access to it. So it's, it was kind of a quick transition then, you know, people were probably not wanting to buy it. And, and it sounds like in a year or two later, it was com- becoming part of the sort of cultural nor- norm within herpeticulture, which is actually kind of refreshing to hear. And and then ha- let, let's talk about how lighting has evolved because we were talking about, you know, the original bulb, the iguana lamp, and then where do we go from there? I'm, I'm not sure when Gary Ferguson gets brought into the mix, probably around then, but but I don't know, maybe we could, this is where we can jump into potentially the spectrum differences and how, how we started and, and then where we, where ZoomEd went from that original product. Sure. Um, actually, you said when you started, the T12s were still still a, mm-hmm. a staple lighting product. So they hung around for a good long while. Yeah, we, we started phasing them out in 2009, 2008, 2009. Oh, that recently? Mm-hmm. As when te- yeah, so we still had them here in the warehouse, and I did customer service also at the time uh, because everyone who does animal care at ZooMed also does customer service. So you don't talk to a customer service person who isn't actually taking care of animals. So we'll mm-hmm. we'll point there. That's interesting. But um, I was the only one at the time doing customer service and animal care, and uh, and people would call in and they'd say, I can't find the bulb that I need. This one is skinny, you know, because the T8 is um, is eight eighths of an inch in diameter instead of 12 eighths of an inch. So they're, it's skinnier. Um, they're like, oh, my, it's not fitting or it's not the right one. And there were some energy efficiency mandates that came into play that made it so T12 um, lighting couldn't be installed in, um, in new buildings any longer. So the ability to even get the glass tubes that uh, the quartz glass tubes that those light bulbs were made out of just became less and less because other large industries that were like, you know, the ones using most of those tubes um, weren't allowed to use them anymore. So we also had to go ahead and switch to TA lighting, which really was good for energy efficiency um, and, you know, added to the evolution definitely of lighting. But uh, it was, yeah, it was interesting having to try to like learn and understand the difference between these different technologies. Well, they look kind of the same, but they're different. Besides the energy efficiency between the T12 and T8, that's a check mark. That's a good thing. But was there issues with the output as far as the lighting? Like, was there, a, you know, did ZoomEd have to go, okay, now we have to, we're sort of forced to use a, a piece of technology that we don't necessarily want to? Or is, uh, is the light coming off those bulbs basically the same? Because now we have all the way up to T5s as well. So we're even skinnier. Yeah, just in testing those over, um, you know, getting some spectral readings of these these older lamps um, ready for this talk, I was surprised how very similar, like at least spectrally, they they were from the T12s, the T8s, and the T5s are you know evolved a little bit more since then. But it's essentially the intensity has uh, has increased, so they have uh, more efficacy at greater gotcha. distance. So T12s you can get quite, cl- you have to get quite close to to get um, a benefit from, and then T8s have stronger output at a greater distance and then t5s even more so and then um actually yeah we can and that's because we're we're talking about high output t5 so t5 right um you can get normal output t5 that would have less of a distance um with with those those wavelengths available but um but the high output t5 so they actually use more energy than the t8s do um but they are definitely um deeper penetrating gotcha okay that's good to know yeah, the uh, the similarities at least between the T8, T12, uh, T5 high outputs as well. Um, the UVB and UVA um, available to them was uh, was pretty darn similar. I mean, except for the Iguana Light 310. I mean, it's mostly a UVA light, and there's a little blip in the tail end of uh, UVB. So I mean, it has 
it has the benefits and effects, but you know, at, at a closer distance, um, you need it. And then I would assume for longer periods of time too, because the output is quite low. But right. um, yeah, otherwise, uh, here we can pull up a picture of one of those to share with you if you like. Yeah, yeah, let's pull up some of those uh, those graphs. We've got a bunch and they look um, pretty similar to each other, <laughs> some of them, so. One of my 210, here we go. So you can kind of see the the biggest difference, uh, to be honest, amongst uh, all of them was um, the in the visible spectrum. I mean, this is, I, I'm not a lighting engineer, so don't, you know, quote me on the, the exactness of this information, but I mean, the, the biggest notice or the biggest uh, change I noticed between them was uh, you've got a, a stronger um, output in the like yellow and red portion of the spectrum mm -hmm. in later versions of these lamps. So this one's, uh, I believe, a, a halophosphate blend. So it's got um, a, a lesser color rendering index um, to a human eye than, say, a T12 or a T8 does. Um, the T12s I, or the T5s use a uh, uh, triphosphate blend, I believe, which renders color better to the human eye and looks a little something like this. So, you know, bearing bearing that in mind, being the, the first of the first, um, you can see what today's, this is a T5 high output, uh, 5.0 reptisun bulb. And the UV oh, wow. and UVA portion of the spectrum is um, not radically different than the last picture we were looking at, but clearly in the visible spectrum, it's got, um, you know, much bigger spikes and, and a much higher CRI value. And obviously they're, they're quite brighter as well. Um, so yeah, it was, it was cool seeing, uh, seeing the change over time. We've also got a, also a T12 bulb, but it was the, uh, the iteration after the Iguana Light 310. It was called the, uh, Reptisun 5.0, but you know, in the, in its T8 version. And that looks a little something like this. So this is the T12 version of the same light we're looking at right now. And yeah, see, in the visible spectrum oh, okay. changes quite a bit, but the UVB and UVA portion of it's not, you know... Not so you just difference. basically lose some some visual intensity. Right, right. And then again, the uh, the intensity at a greater distance is uh, is quite a bit higher for a T5 high output. But, um, right. you know, you overlay these images and they're, they're not as staggeringly different as you might guess. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's kind of cool seeing those early, the, the early days and how it's evolved to where we are now. And we'll get into the LED stuff in a little bit as well, because that's sort of the next phase of, of, of lighting. I, I'm curious about, I don't know, when did Gary Ferguson jump into the mix? Because that seemed like it was such a an, an important thing because I think it simplified things for people. It became very like cut and dry. This is, you know, these are the animal. this is the animals for this, this uh, power, this type of UV and, and so on and so on. And it became a lot more simple for people. And, and I think it just gave the whole idea more credibility. I'm not sure, but it's, it, it is, does seem simpler. So when did he kind of get folded in? I, I wish I knew an exact date for something like that or, or uh, timeline wise. I'm not too sure. Do you know? Uh, I got the impression at least it was quite early days as far as that okay. T12s came about. But, but I don't me. know that that's when the Ferguson zones that we know now you know, were, were necessarily developed. That's been uh, more recent that we okay. have that better understanding. So Gary Ferguson was doing research on like UVB and panther chameleons and things like that. He actually right. came and visited us um, a couple of years ago. 2020? 2020. Or no, uh, maybe 21? 19. I can't remember. Yeah. He came and visited us um, and we did an interview with him and it was... Um, uh, it was so interesting to hear him talk about his story of how he was, you know, uh, helping someone who was importing chameleons and um, and how the, the the issues that they had with the babies that hatched and um, and kind of the the whole evolution of his research. And um, so he was, you know, he he was involved with understanding like UVB, but I I don't know exactly when that index. The UV index was was, or at least when the index and the the Ferguson zones kind of like came together to give us that better understanding. But boy, since they have, um, that's been a real game game changer for for just understanding because we've had UVB meters for a really long time, and people would hang on to this thing, pay a lot of money for it, and be like, okay, my UVB meter says I have fifty microwatts per square centimeter. And we're like, cool. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, it's definitely it definitely helped. It's revolutionized just the usage of it. And I, I'll I'll make sure I put the uh, Gary Ferguson interview in the show notes. It's been, I think I watched. I've, I know I've watched it, but maybe it's been about a year or so now. So I kind of forget. I'll have to go watch it myself again. But yeah, I remember it being pretty fascinating. And that again, that's those early days of us sort of piecing it together and you know learning that you know, the sun is a pretty powerful input for these animals in the wild. And, and if we're missing that in captivity, it can be pretty catastrophic. So why don't we move into the the, the newer technology with, with the LEDs? And uh, I, I don't know, maybe Andrew, you kind of want to lay out this this technology. And of course, I have a few questions about it as well. But but where are we sitting with this tech right now? I don't know if you want to know like the, the lead up to it. Or, yeah, sure. I would love to. Yeah, they were. Um, I mean, these are samples that predate my time here by quite a bit. But I mean, the, the very first UVB LED sample that we got was, you know, more than 10 years ago. And it was, uh, you know, developed for the medical industry for um, psoriasis treatment. So they're, they're UVB chips, but they were like $600 a diode. And they didn't have wow. the, the lifespan that, you know, current ones do today. So it's come a long way. I have it here, actually. It's, a, it's like a long linear bar with a series of eight chips along that along that bar but the intensity at the at distance and uh, even the the spectrum on those has you know been radically different compared to the newest ones that are in uh, is that one are all all six chips the exact same wavelength they are yeah yes yeah. So, okay mean, this was uh, uh even between like the launch of our our first uvb led product and and today um there's a much wider variety of chips that have become available just in that narrow window of time. So um, as far as... Which has only been like a couple of years, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, as far as you saying, like it's it's the lead up to, you know, future lighting. I yeah, strong agree on, on that one. I mean, that I'm sure five years from now, we'll have even a, you know, much wider variety of chips available at that time. But yeah, that was that was the start of them getting, you know, samples and testing them out. And, you know, obviously it was not a viable product at the time to pursue, but worth testing and like monitoring and, and keeping on the ball. Um, and then yeah, fast forward to uh, the leading up to the launch of our first UVB LED. Um, that one had uh, UVB chips that we had sourced from, we've tried from a number of different countries uh, that, that sourced those that are, you know, obviously mass produced in China. And then uh, we tried some from other, other countries as well. And uh, the ones used in the final product are like Japanese uh, UVB LEDs that are from what we found testing wise, like the highest quality that we could come across, like bar none as far as uh, lifespan wise. And then um, just their, uh, their QC and like quality um, for, for those chips. And uh, yeah, Japanese manufacturing is usually pretty solid. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, we, uh, so yeah, regarding that product, um, had four of those UVB LED chips. They're like, I believe, 310 nanometer uh, peak chips. And then there's a longer wave UVA chip and invisible light 6500K uh, visible chips. Um, and then, yeah, you're right, that was launched a couple of years back now. Um, and then, you know, what was the, Follow up on <laughs> no, 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 no worries. <laughs> since then, it, it, there has been. You said there's new, newer chips since that initial launch. So, are the is the product now like where it stands today? Is it uh, maybe you could lay out what it is like? What's changed from two years ago? I, I assume you have different chips, different wavelengths. Sure, sure. Yeah. So the the very first iterate, the first one that we had launched, uh, we're now calling the the first generation one. Um, that uh, when we launched it and produced you know product video for it and uh, update our website page for it, um, it's something that you know you need to use and blend with other lamps to get. A full spectrum available to your animal just like how the same goes for a t5 you know you can't use that on its own for your reptiles you know you need a heat source as well you need supplemental lighting to illuminate their basking site um same goes for this product so at least our combination we'd recommended using that that worked quite nicely was um uh, a basking spot lamp a 75 watt is one that we um produce some spectral readings on to kind of show how the uh, spectrum changes as you blend like all of your your lamps together. Um, you right. know, I can pull some of those up if you'd like to. Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, and and as you do that, I'll just because that was one of the areas that we've talked about on the podcast before is some of the shortcomings of of the LED UV lighting is is the lack of chips right now. And, you know, oh, sure. you, like you said, in the last two years, we've developed these companies have developed a, a further spectrum of chips, but there's always been this. Um, 
I guess it's more of a hypothesis from, especially the, the reptile lighting folks in the UK, that if you're just using the LED UV lights, you may be lacking some of the, the UV spectrum that turns off vitamin D, D production, which can potentially, you know, theoretically send an animal into hypervitaminosis D3, which could, you know, could be deadly. So it is, is the way that ZooMed sort of handles that potential hypothesis is just by saying, let's blend with a, with a fluorescent UV ball? Yeah, yeah. I mean, from the start, that's been how we've recommended using this product. There's, there is no, uh, uh, you know, one size fits all uh, lamp that'll provide every parameter from the sun. So the the best sure. thing that we've got available now is, you know, blending the best sources that we've got that fill a certain part of the spectrum, you know, a heat source of choice. Um, the UVB LED is something, you know, that you can blend with that as well. And then um, we make a, a linear fluorescent bulb that doesn't produce UVB, um, but it's a, a got a nice rounded UVA spectrum um, and a nice uh, high CRI visible light output. Um, that we had recommended to be used, uh, you know, in conjunction with that lamp. So the way that spectrum kind of shifts is what you're seeing now is just the UVB LED all on its lonesome. And then when you add in a, uh, just a like 75 watt basking bulb, it'll um, change to a spectrum looking like this. And then um, as you, as you add in, let's see here, that linear fluorescent bulb I was uh, describing, it, it fills out the spectrum rather nicely. Let's see. This is what it looks like with all the three lamps uh, running together. Um, so, gotcha. So I think it's important to you know be aware of the shortcomings of specific bulbs, but um, you know to be honest, there every single bulb has a shortcoming of some kind, so it, it does need to work in tandem with another lamp that you know rounds it out. So this would be what I, I think it's important to be aware of those and, and know how to fill the rest of the spectrum in, um, but. It's equally important, I think, to know what the blended spectrum looks like when you've got all of your lamps running over your animal and are like providing for them in their habitat. You know, you, you wouldn't have just one of those lamps on uh, throughout the whole day. But this is yeah. what, you know, your your heat source, your uh, a linear fluorescent that has nice UVA output, and then a UVB LED um, looks like all, all blended together. Um, the the reptile lighting group uh, online has been pretty fantastic with uh, showing blended spectrums of of different lights running in conjunction. And I think there's a couple of limiting factors that I'm sure plenty of regular keepers run into is you know the cost of having a, a larger variety of lamps uh, running together and then space um, on the top of your habitat. Um, but I know that they uh, recommend plenty using the uh, uh, metal halide lights for nice visible light and UVA output. And that's a, a product we have out in the market as well that um, does a great job of that, our PowerSign HID. Um, and then, you know, they have, a whole mess of uh, different spectrum um, shots that show you, you know, different blended lamps running together and kind of how that spectrum shifts as it's, uh, you know, different or newer lamps are, are blended in together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think most most serious reptile keepers know you need three lamps. Like you're going to have to use, there's three bulbs on top of your enclosures. It's just, you have to do that. And and a lot of times when people say like, can't there just be an all in one bulb? It's just a fundamental misunderstanding of how light works. It'd just be like essentially impossible to do something like that. And uh, I don't know, I think it's easy to have three bulbs or, or four bulbs or however many you need to, to provide the, the light. Do you, do you have, do you guys have an opinion on that vitamin D hypervitaminosis theory at all? I'm not sure, Andrew, you were just in the UK at the, at the AHH conference. I'm not sure if you talked to anyone about that specifically, but uh, at, at this point, where do you guys sit on that? Yeah, I mean, there was a great talk um, that uh, Dr. Serena Wunderleek did um, describing just that. And um, I, I think it's like plenty valid. And again, um, we wouldn't recommend using a lamp in that way, but I think that that theory would, you know, hold water. I mean, it's, uh, it's the same reason we wouldn't recommend using, you know, just one lamp to provide for any animal's uh, conditions, um, you know, in the long term. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend using just just one light of ours either because you know like you said you've got to have to blend those products together to get something as as close or as true to the sun's uh, spectrum as you can get which you know it's uh, it's been a long time that these products have been evolving and changing and, and we're still still pretty far cry away from the sun but that's uh it's an understandably like very tall order so i'm sure yeah years you know five years six years from now um we'll be you know that much closer and with the development of uvb i'm sorry uh led uvbs we've we see this topic as, um, you know, it's it's kind of in the center of everything right now, right? Like 
what the the full spectrum looks like and everything. Um, but at, you know, at, probably not accidentally, but anecdotally, we we've been practicing this for so long. We've we actually were talking about it yesterday, and uh, we have this slider hood, which is a product yeah. that we've discontinued. But this was a really popular. We grabbed one. Um, this was a really popular item. This is the smallest uh, one. This is the smallest one. It's this yeah. big beast of a whoa. Of a what hood. is this? Okay, wow. Um, and this, uh, it was popular when I started working here. We we haven't made it for several years because it's kind of big and bulky. But you can see it holds a linear fluorescent, and it has two spots for different um, types of lamps. I, I think it's um. Oh yeah, it's locked right now. Yeah, it's locked up right now. I mean, There's a it. spare power socket but, in there. Uh, you know, we we've known that you need to have multiple items on your animals forever since T12s. Um, we've yeah, got another yeah. one over there that's called a reptile combination hood. That again, we've also discontinued because it's bigger and bulkier than most people want on their tanks right now. But um, but that one houses four incandescent or you know screw in type bulbs and uh, and a four foot uh, linear T12s, fluorescent yeah. T12. So it's like we've it's we're, we're kind of coming back around to like really understanding and saying, okay, well maybe, maybe uh, it, as nice as it would be to have an all in one, that's not the case. And it hasn't ever been the case. So um, yeah. It, and it will never, it will most it likely never be the case. <laughs> yeah. Which is totally fine. I mean, I, I actually like running more than one ball because I, I love sort of simulating a, a bit of a sunrise and sunset. So you leave the hal- halogens come on first and the visible light and the, the UV and whatnot. And, and, uh, I, I love that. I love coming down in my reptile room at nighttime, at dusk, or in the in dawn, and just having the halogens on and sort of that warm glow. And I, I like I said, I think everybody who's serious about reptile keeping likes to have more than one bulb. So, and they also understand that it's pretty much impossible to combine uh, those the entire wavelength into 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 one bulb. It doesn't really make any sense. But and speaking of replicating sunrise and sunset. This is a question that I always get and people in the comments will demand this for sure. And I know that because you guys have uh, an aquarium line as well, aquarium lighting, especially on the visible side, is al- always seems two or three steps ahead of reptile lighting. And the biggest thing is this programmable piece where you can have a, a light ramp on and ramp off. Uh, why, why isn't that on our reptile side. I mean, I know we could probably just go buy the fish light and put it on our reptile enclosures, but is it a marketing thing or are we, is that in the works in any way? Yeah. The, the joke that I've always heard at least is that uh, the difference between, you know, the marine hobby and the reptile hobby is the marine hobby will spend thousands and thousands of dollars on their equipment and not bat an eye. And then the reptile hobby will spend that much acquiring their animal and then try to stitch together as uh, cheap as possible the the remaining uh, equipment you know to, to help yeah. them so I, I don't know if it's a a mindset or an attitude difference but yeah it's it's very accurate like we've noticed that also plenty that you know marine hobby is typically comfortable listing a you know an entry model lamp being like eight hundred dollars and people are like oh yeah that's, <laughs> yeah. that's great um yeah, yeah i need that. that that makes sense and reptile people are like that I happen to have that. a reef keeper at home who will spend that kind of money on a very expensive reef product. So there you go. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's ever in the works at all, but to have a, a visible, like just an LED light that's just focusing on visible light, having that ramp on, ramp off technology, or, or if somebody wants that, should they just go buy a, a marine light? I, I think it's ideal. Like that's it. It's only what makes sense, you know, to to replicate it as best as possible. And I'm, I have no doubt that it will eventually like be a widespread or commonplace thing. And it, you know, the more adapted it gets, the cheaper it'll drive the price down and be more accessible to, you know, regular keepers. Um, I, I can't comment on anything being like worked on, you know, for us or anything uh, in the moment, but um, yeah, it's a, the more you try to replicate the sun spectrum, like you, you can't ignore that, you know, very critical piece of, you know, having certain lamps chime on at certain points or, or ramping up and ramping down to, you know, better replicate that, that spectral difference uh, throughout the day that shift, you know, even throughout the whole daylight besides just the ramp yeah. up and ramp down, um, you know, during dawn and dusk. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I know it's not, it's sim- easier said than done for some things like the UV, obviously it's probably, you can't do that. And what maybe, it, well, maybe with the LED technology at some point in the future you can, but um, I, I know there'll be people commenting about that. So, so, so we'll just have our fingers crossed that one day that'll be a thing. And, and until then, 
just go buy a, an aquarium light that has that built-in feature or just do what I do and have the halogens click on first. But for whatever reason, that like idea of ramping on, ramping off is so attractive to people. And it's just, it's just funny. Like you said, you just go to the next aisle over and there's all this crazy lighting for, for fish. And, and then on our side, we, we uh, don't have as much, but, but anyway, sort of branching off this topic, um, there, at least from, in my opinion, in the last, maybe like, I don't know, 10 or 20 years, but particularly in the last five years, I think there's been a pretty significant push for just more ethical keeping in, in, in the reptile hobby. And I just see this, you know, people wanting to get bigger enclosures and providing more enrichment. And, you know, the, the lighting has been a huge thing as well, providing better lighting for our animals and just striving to replicate nature as best as we can. And I'm, I'm curious, how aware is ZooMed of that? And I don't mean like you two, obviously you two are aware of it, but when I talk about ZooMed, it's a company. So it's a little bit, it's more of a ship that you have to steer. It's not something that's as nimble. So is, is that something that ZooMed pays attention to? And, and if so, how does that change product development along the way? Because maybe we are eking our way towards somebody who's willing to spend $500 on a light rather than wanting to you know, go buy 20 light bulbs from Home Depot for five bucks or something. So is, is ZooMed uh, aware of that? And are, are you guys attempting to sort of culture that, that new mindset that seems to be popping up? I think what you bring up is a really interesting point. And uh, I just want to clear up a little tiny bit. Like Andrew and I are, you know, we're we're just Andrew and I here. But also Gary comes back into the animal room. We do um, animal care. We do customer service. We do research and development. Um, everybody who's on our animal care team is also doing customer service, research and development, um, social media. So... The, it's it's not like a huge corporate structure. Everybody's here in this building. Gary comes back several times a day and is always putting articles on our desk and is always <laughs> handing us new assignments and asking questions and getting his hands into the animal tanks and feeding the fish even when we told him they've already been fed twice. <laughs> <laughs> but he wants to see them eat. He wants to see them eat. Um, he's he's very involved and and that's the way this whole um, our whole company works. Uh, I know Zoomed like reaches far and wide and like I said, growing up here, I've been exposed to it forever. But it's it's a small business, so yeah. If we're aware, everyone's aware, and uh, um, it's it's helpful, um, I think, to have that kind of structure as far as um, incorporating those things into our research and development. I think it's it's constant. You know, we're we're constantly not only trying to like follow the market, but trying to to drive it in some ways, you know. So uh, we want to provide not only what's best for animals, but what's best for the keepers who are keeping those animals and making it, um, helping them to be successful with their pets from the very beginning. A lot of our customers are um, those beginner customers too, you mm-hmm. know, um, since, since we are spread so far, um, and getting our products is, is pretty accessible to most people. We want to make sure that, uh, that the people who come home from the pet store with their leopard gecko, that was an impulse buy today, we want to make sure that they can have success, um, with the products that they get, with the education that they find on our website and, um, and that it turns into like a real hobby. So, yeah, we're definitely aware of that culture and um, and honestly super stoked <laughs> that it's becoming more and more widespread because the more support um, that gets out there, the more likely we are to be able to um, to help push that along. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Does that answer the yeah. question? <laughs> Oh yeah, no, definitely. And I think it's probably, it's probably deceiving because ZooMed is everywhere, especially as a reptile keeper, you see it everywhere that it does seem like it's a huge company, especially because there's competitors to ZooMed that are huge companies and that are owned by big conglomerate type situations. So they are a big corporate structure and uh, ZooMed is almost like a mom and pop shop, but just is everywhere. You know, it's, it, it really is pervasive across the reptile hobby, which is, which is really cool. As far as the research and development, goes how, how does that work like is it you guys are thinking of ideas and thinking of products that might work and maybe one of you could walk through you know if you don't have to walk through a specific example but how, how does the development of new products go down yeah, yeah if you wanted an example of a specific product the the uvb led is a great example of one just be sure sure pretty cutting edge tech and then it's it evolving like constantly you know the availability of diodes and ships um if you'd like, we can show you the uh, 
the next generation of it that we ha- haven't announced otherwise like before, but we've got some some spectral ones yes. if you'd like to see. So to be clear, yeah, Andrew is announcing a new product right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and it's our okay. second generation UVB LED. <laughs> okay, here we go. This is exciting. <laughs> yeah. So the um you know the natural progression for a lamp like this is uh the probably the most uh you know widely understood or just uh the, the gold standard of UVB provision now would be the our, our German made T5 lamps that have been in the hobby for a good while and um you know people are 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 well aware of so that was the uh the model for this next generation UVB LED as far as the uh, the UVB and UVA portion of the spectrum um obviously in this in this one we uh, bumped up the the visible light um intensity on the on our newest generation one but also rounding out that spectrum like you'd mentioned um, has kind of been on the forefront of everybody's minds of uh, you know UVB LED. So our our T5s were the the map that we were um, you know targeting um, for for this lamp. Sure. So in this uh, iteration, you can see there's the the first leftmost. Bite. So is this the sorry? Is this the T5 or is this the new the new generation? It's the new generation uh, UVB LED. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So you can tell the you know the UVB and and low wavelength the uh, shorter wavelength UVA portion of the spectrum is much broader. Um, the uh, the leftmost spike you can see is uh, at the UVB chips, and then beyond that, as we work rightwards, there's uh, an addition in this uh, lamp of uh, some three three twenty five nanometer UVA chips and three forty nanometer UVA chips, and uh, their spectrums overlap enough that it creates that that kind of nice uh, rounded hump. Um, throughout the UVB and UVA portion of it, um, and at the uh, at the AHH conference in the UK, there was the um, you know very talented uh, Tom Griffiths, who you might recognize from the um, Reptile Lighting Group, uh, and he runs a consulting uh, business for you know uh, animals in general. Lighting does third party lighting analysis, and uh, worked up some some graphics. Um, for us on this uh, product, just to have a, a third party take on, um, you know, this lamp uh, before we while we were developing it. Um, before I get to that, I can kind of show you uh, just in line with the UVB LED first generation where we showed the addition of uh, lamps kind of changing the blended spectrum. Um, this is the you know, second generation UVB LED. And then as you add a um, heat source of your choice, this is just a uh, 75 watt basking spot lamp it'll it'll uh change to something like this mm. and then as you blend in even the uh fluorescent bulb that we were talking about just to keep it the same as uh our, our first generation that we were showing examples of you know blended lights um with those three lamps together you end up with a spectrum that looks like this which is again it's it's not the sun but it's uh it's it's a much better, much closer uh, blend and representation, um, you know, today than you know even a few years back. So, like I said, yeah. yeah. And if you compare that back to the original T12, it's uh, night and day. Oh yeah, no pun intended. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so we we have uh, you know equipment in our lighting room to to verify and check the um, spectral uh, intensity of uh, of all of our lamps. Um, it helps to just have that equipment in house in terms of you know making R and D. Uh, just more filled out process but we also always use a, a third party and uh, Francis Baines was like pivotal and you know uh, providing that kind of objective uh, feedback and uh, analysis for lamps I would assume across like all reptile brands I mean it's a yeah definitely a, a staple staple name for you know objective analysis of these lamps and uh, we we found the same professionalism and uh, objectivity from Tom Griffiths uh, running uh, analysis on these lamps before we uh um, before we you know finalized its um its layout and its uh, chip combination so i can show you kind of uh, a comparison of the uvb and uva portion of the spectrum compared to a t5 lamp because again that was you know kind of our our target spectrum so here's the uh you know various moderating uh, lines of uh action spectrum for um processes that will you know break down excess vitamin d as it's produced um and where they yeah. where they lay on the uh on the spectrum and then overlaid on that um, you can see, see in in red we've got the 
uh, T5 lamp. And then in the blue overlay is the, the newest version of the UVB LED. So it's, uh, you know, contour is much closer um, than a previous version. And, you know, if, if we were to talk in a few years from now, I bet it'd be, you know, an even closer match yet um, as uh, more chips, you know, become available and uh, a wider variety of them are, are used in just other industries to drive the cost down and make them, you know, more accessible for everyone. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's a little sneak peek at, you know, where something like that has come over the last few years since we launched the first one. Yeah. And Andrew that is really amazing. a lot of like the lighting and hardware and stuff like that. But as you know, ZoomEd has a very wide variety, full line really of, of reptile care supplies. So the process often it's, it's really organic um, because like I said, we, we house over 80 species of reptiles here. Um, we've hatched over 60 of those. We've got a, a very wide, extensive collection, both housed indoors and in our greenhouse facility. And so a lot of the, the products that we come up with are because our keepers, the, the people who are, are doing customer service and, and animal care, say, gosh, I wish we had something like this. You know, I wish we had a tank that filled this whole rack. So we go to our glassworks facility, which is just down the street where they're building our tanks. And where he's like, hey, don't tell Gary, but could you please build us a tank this size so that we can use it in the animal room? And then he comes in and he's like, wow, this is a really great tank. Well, the next thing we know, we have our low boy, which is our 50 gallon, you know, four foot by by 24 inch, um, 10 inch tall tank. Um, we're releasing that in a 40 gallon footprint this year. And, um, and they've just been really well received. Uh, automatic misters are, our, our uh, environmental control center, you know, this is stuff that we're like, boy, I'm just tired of having, you know, three different timers and a, you know, a humidistat and a thermostat. And I wish we had a dimming thermostat too. And like, okay, well, let's just get all of these things and smash them into one and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and make it happen. So, um, also, on top of customer service, you know, where we do have one on one contact with our customers. So we get a lot of feedback from the field as well. Um, being on the research and development team, if you call ZooMed during our business hours, you'll talk to a human in the front office who will then send your call back to one of us who is probably cleaning a turtle tank or chopping up food <laughs> or something like that. Uh, and we'll talk to you about whatever product question or complaint you have um, or animal care questions that you have. And and then we hear like, hey, I had two people that asked for this today. And uh, and we're able to incorporate that into our research and development you know, of new products or making adjustments to products that we've been making for a long time. Like... Um, I don't know. Every, everything, everything has evolved since I've been here. And, uh, and it just happens like, I think really organically. Um, we also have a, uh, a, a large team of reps that are out in the field, uh, all over the U S Canada and Europe. And, uh, and we get direct feedback from them all the time without having like a big corporate structure. It allows us to really, you know, integrate constantly and, and talk one on one with each other, you know, as humans, as as keepers, you know, the our reps are some of the most incredible keepers I've ever met. And um, yeah, they've all got their specialty of some kind. We've got a mm -hmm. rep in the Midwest who's all about Egyptian tortoises. We've got a rep on the East Coast all about glass frogs. In Canada, we've got sailfin expert I mean, Eric down in Florida. He's jack of all trades, gecko and and everything. And, uh, and so we get direct feedback from them and they're going into the pet stores and they're talking with pet store owners and with keepers and with customers. So, um, so I think the research and development is, um, is really real. And, and like I said, getting this feedback um, all the time just helps us out immensely because our needs as keepers on the central coast in California are different from keepers in Minnesota and keepers in Florida and Europe and everything. So we're able to really get information from all over the place, but just in a really direct manner. And, uh, and we use them as like really helpful. test subjects too. I mean, we'll, you know, we'll, as a products and prototype phase, we'll send it out to them and say, Hey, is this performing to your needs? Or like, does this check all the boxes you'd like it to? What would you do differently on it? 
um, yeah, we definitely use them for feedback as often as you can. Cause you know, if you, uh, if you only make something tailored to your needs, you kind of, uh, kind of have blinders on as to, you know, what somebody else might interpret, you know, a product for. So yes. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. Really helpful. And it's probably pretty fun. I bet it is super fun. <laughs> When is the uh, and, and thanks for announcing the the next generation lighting there as well. Oh. That's that's really cool. When when is that targeted to be released? Um, they're they're being produced now, so I, I don't exactly know the timeline beyond that. But um, you know, I'd imagine. But sometime in this calendar year. I yeah, we're only in March. Yeah, I'd expect so. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, can I ask you guys a tougher question now? Because. I won't put you on the spot too much, but you know, there, there's always certain products in, in a company's product line that most people who are sort of, I don't even want to call them advanced keepers, but people who are, you know, advancing, uh, would, would never use like, you know, like colored light bulbs and whatnot. And that, that's probably a big one, you know, like red light bulbs, purple, the, the nighttime bulbs and whatnot. And I always wonder why, you know, because it's not that they're, it's more like they're out of date in a, in a way, but I know that people who are new would still buy those products. So I, I, I just wonder, and I don't want to put you guys on the spot too much, but, and, and, and this is not just a Zoomed thing. It's kind of a, a reptile company thing. A lot of companies sell similar products. And I just wonder what, what the utility of selling some of those things that I would c- kind of classify as being more outdated, like uh, heat rocks and whatnot. Is, is there a, is there a purpose for that to still be in the product line or, or where do you guys see that? I, I don't want to, again, don't want to put you on the spot too much, but, but what are your thoughts on that? For the red glass bulbs, at least what I usually see them used in. And this was something that kind of like stood out to me when I was visiting a really cool place in uh, the San Francisco Bay area, the um, Academy of uh, Academy of Sciences. Um, where they've got a massive collection of animals. Um, pretty much anything that's a nocturnal species they've got there is uh, it put under like a red lamp to not, you know, freak them out during the daytime having bright white lights over them. So I've, for the most part, seen them used as a, a nighttime viewing lamp and not as a, you know, basking lamp or, you know, something that's used as like a, a primary heat source. Obviously, there's, you know, heat coming off of those lamps. But um, for the most part, I've seen them used, you know, in a far corner of a of a housing or a habitat to show a, a nocturnal species enclosure sure. environment or or otherwise um, when you know visitors are passing th- passing through the uh, like animal um, you know collections there. Yeah, yeah, kind of like a, like a zoo sort of situation where the lights might be dim and you're sort of highlighting something. Sure, sure. And well, at at home may want to do that as well. You know, I mm. want my habitats to be like zoo enclosures, right? Like that's kind of something that um, we'll sort of strive for. So if I want to view my nocturnal animals, I want to have the ability to do that too. So that's why it's not just a zoo thing, but it's, um, you know, it's it have that accessibility for anyone. And there's other nighttime heat lamps we've got too that are, you know, emit no visible light. So as far as like having options out there, I think there's, there's a lot of them available, you know, ceramic. Emit- yeah. There's also a carbon filament. You guys have like a deep heat projector, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. So those, you know, in three different wattages you can have as either, you know, running conjunction with a, a daytime, you know, lamp of some sort to illuminate a basking site. They work great for that. Or, you know, if you need a, a non-visible uh, heat source, like that's, you know, another option. And you have a new one right, of those right. that we just released. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> There's always new things coming. Well, one one product that I, I don't know if it's new or if it's uh, just hadn't seen it before, which was like, uh, I think, I don't know if I might be saying the name wrong, but it's a Repti cooler. It was like a, almost like an air conditioning. And I, I had only stumbled across this last week while I was looking at your, your products. And uh, my, my friend Liam, actually, who you would have met, Andrew, in the UK was telling me about it as well. Oh, cool. And uh, so I was like, oh, that's really fascinating. It's like something that you normally don't associate with reptiles trying to keep things warmer. You know, we, we don't t- talk about cooling, but there's a huge need for cooling a lot of times. So let's, can we talk about that product? How new is that? And then what was the sort of the, the reason to develop a thing? And then how does it work? Sure. Yeah. Um, that was a product release maybe two and a half, maybe three years ago now at this mm-hmm. point. Um, but yeah, that was another product that developed because of feedback from, you know, some of our sales reps or some of the uh, like montane species that we keep here. Yeah, I think I wanted to get some Jackson's chameleons. And uh, it's like, you know, we just, they're they're always challenging to keep them cool enough. 
Um, especially if you have a variety of other reptiles in the room that want some heat, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and to keep them cool enough, but also with a thermal gradient. So we actually have ours set up with a repti cooler and a fogger to help the the uh, moisture stay up, um, and a tiny little um, halogen basking spot lamp in the back corner so that they have a, a good thermal gradient. And we'll see this cryptic basking going on and um, some really cool behaviors and they've thrived and bred and um, in the same room as where we have our bearded dragons. So um, it was a need and so we did it. <laughs> yeah, and the way it works is um, it's got an, an intake on the rearmost part of it um, that pulls in you know, air from your, from your warm reptile room. Um, it forces it through a a wet membrane, um, like a little cartridge that has a membrane running up and down the top of it. And there's a, a little like standing pool that that uh, cartridge sits in. It wicks the water up through it um, as your warm air passes through that wet membrane. Um, the, through forced air action, you get like an evaporative cooling effect. So it'll drop the air temperature by having that... Um, that evaporation pulling energy away from the, the warm air and then it ejects it down through an exhaust port in the bottom of the ripti cooler uh, with like a little directional vent on it and you can have you know cool air pumping in in one corner of your habitat and then yeah like ashley said you can have a small low wattage heat source in the opposite end and keep you know a nice little temperature gradient in your habitat um, we've seen them you know with with great effect, like work on a variety of species here and um, you know you can increase or amplify the effects by putting chilled water in there or you can even put ice cubes in there and no water in the reservoir and uh, you know you'll amplify that that temperature change um, even more so yeah that's really neat i mean you think of, i think what you had said ashley is you know having because one thing that happens to people have species from different parts of the world they constantly have to create like two reptile rooms like here's my cool room and my warm room so it'd be kind of cool to have um just a couple devices so people don't need to take another room of their house for the reptiles just you know ha- have those coolers on to maybe you have like a new caledonian species or something that's that needs the air a little bit cooler how how long will the water last in like i'm, I'm sure people probably just cycle them on they're probably not on full blast but if you were to leave it on all the time how long until you have to refill Oh, that's a great question. I wish I had it memorized. It's definitely on our instructions. Um, it's got a three-speed fan setting. Um, so you can okay. have it, if you have it on the lowest setting, I want to say it's like 60 or 70 hours, you can keep it running um, straight. And then on the highest fan speed setting, setting three, um, I think it's just a little... Actually, Davey in here is uh, pulling up those numbers on our uh, sure. instruction page. But yeah, it's you, know, you, can, you can definitely dial down its uh, its output if you need to have it just you know running in the background or you can run it on a timer too when we were developing that product that was another you know kind of function that we demanded on it was uh, if you are using it with an environmental control center and you've got a thermostat that's turning it off and on off and on as it's needed um, it needs to return to the fan speed setting that you had it on if you cut power to it and then turn right. power to it so oh here I can get you those numbers real quick oh sure see it says 54 uh, hours 54 hours at the lowest hours. setting and then 36 hours on the center uh or middle setting and then the highest you can have it run in 18 yeah. hours before it um for it needs to be reached. so if you're putting that on a timer that you get a good you know you could get a couple weeks out of that if you're just running it like an hour or so a day or something for jackson's we top it off every morning and it's usually dropped by an inch and a half or so. It's a reservoir that's maybe four and a half, five inches. Like but it runs, milliliters. it pretty much runs all day because again, it's in a room that we've got many, many different species, but a lot of bearded dragons and they're up high because, you know, we want to give them that, that um, height and elevation. Um, so it's warmer up there. And uh, yeah, so it, it runs all the time, but we see the animals use all of their habitat with that. On. Sure. And, um, and it's really nice to be able to see all these great, like natural behaviors. When I think about the animal room and the showroom at ZooMed, it, it's, I mean, I could see why an animal person would want that because it's great. You get to work with animals all day and you have these different species, but from a business perspective, that's probably a pretty big expense just to have, you know, that functioning is, is the reason for it just so you can, yeah, yeah. You got to plug your ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it be, just be, so you have hands-on experience all the time? And so you guys can become, make sure you are, you know, up to speed herp, herpeticulturalists? This is, that's definitely how we justify it. It's really because Gary loves <laughs> <Yeah>. the animals. 
<laughs> you know, yeah. it's really, you know, they're his pets. Um, but it it gives us, um, I think, a lot more credibility. And it, it makes us unique as a company because we all, like I said, so I say all of us. So how many people are on animal care? Seven? So I think there's seven of us. And for, for all of the other components of our jobs, be it customer service, research, research and development, um, all of the, the different hats and everything that we wear, having the animals um, here, in addition to everybody's got collections at home, uh, but having mm-hmm. the animals here really, uh, we don't have an excuse to not be able to answer your questions when you call, you know? And, right. Um, or you can ask somebody who does know the answer if it's something you don't know, like you've got mm-hmm. resources close by, you know, but oh, let me go ask my We're never like reading out of a manual or something, you know? Um, and again, that, that research and development, um, it just comes from such a natural an organic place that I'm, you know, there's probably a, there's a lot, I'm sure a lot of, of people that are like, oh man, I wish I had this. And they go into like, you know, trying to develop their own product and, and some people can, and some people can't. And we're, we're really lucky to, um, to have the resources to be able to follow through with a lot of those things. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what the animals are for really they're because we like them and their pets. Uh, but, but we can justify it because they, they mean a lot to the company. Yeah, it's you know? valuable yeah. hands-on experience for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And as I already mentioned, Andrew, you had you were in the UK last weekend for the Advancing Herpetoculture or Husbandry Conference, AHH conference. I always say, because animals at home, AAH, it becomes a tongue twister. But anyway, I, I, you'd already mentioned a few things that you had picked up while you were there. Is there anything that uh, that you had mentioned that you thought was worth sharing? Because I'm sure you, I'm sure there was a, a lot to pack into your brain over the weekend because there's an, an amazing amount of, of uh, presentations that get made. But is there anything that sticks out? Yeah. I mean, a whole bunch of like amazing talks. Um, one thing that I thought was very cool while I was sitting in the like the back row taking notes. I was like, oh, they're recording every single one of these talks. So I think I, mm-hmm. I don't want to speak for them, but I would assume the reason is for that. It's it's very, you know, an open source like platform. So I'd expect that they're gonna be sharing every one of those talks and they're, you know, each one just as fascinating as the the other. Um, one thing that was a cool like live happening in the back of the room while all these talks were going on is um uh, Dr. Serena Wunderlich and, and Tom Griffiths uh, were testing, like they were doing the biggest batch testing of solar meters. I think that's ever happened. Um, and they, you know, had people bring your solar meters with you. We're going to have some uh, test lamps set up in some shadow boxes, and we're going to take measurements at the exact same distance and uh, compare results and make a probably very messy, huge spreadsheet of uh, like all the different results across, um, you know, different meters and. It was cool because, you know, Francis Baines, of course, was there and brought with her the um, Tom Griffiths was telling me the the second UV index meter that was produced, like serial number zero 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 two. So I mean, you can wow. compare like almost the very first one to you know one that was bought a week ago or something like that, and 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 check their uh, spectral response. So I thought that was like a very impressive and like. Uh, yeah, heroic undertaking that happened just in the back of the room, like while these talks were happening, they were just plugging away over the course of a couple of days doing that. So I That's thought that really was cool. a, a very cool thing happening in the back of the room. Um, and you said there was like a hundred. Yeah, I think I. Yeah, don't quote me. I, I think there's over a hundred of them being tested. And if I wow. if I remember right, they said the biggest sampling before that was like six. So so it's like wow. Yeah, I mean they you know knocked it out of the park as far as uh you know data collection. I mean, that was a, a, a seriously impressive undertaking happening feet away from some of these very, very interesting talks. Um, yeah, I would encourage you to, to watch them when they do, you know, post them and make them available. Um, nice thing about that, that group in general is uh, the, the open source kind of camaraderie between them. Like nobody keeps, you know, secrets or information to themselves. It's like all put out there. Uh, for the betterment of the hobby and like for the advancement of it. So, you know, they, uh, yeah, it's, I, I look forward to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a really cool group of people. That's for sure. Well, as we wrap up here, one thing I think that may, m- many people probably are not aware of is how much sort of breeding and conservation work that ZooMed is involved in, in some capacity, whether, you know, there's, there's a, a pretty big importance on conservation 
in within this it seems like within the zoo, zoo meds sort of ethos so maybe maybe one of you wanted to kind of mention some of the projects that zoo med is involved in and, and some of the conservation efforts that, that they've been able to accomplish well we <laughs> i know right um, <laughs> long question yeah there's uh there's quite a few um we're really lucky to be involved with uh, a variety of different organizations that are really working on conservation um, we have the TTPG, uh, Turtle and Tortoise Preservation Group, the Turtle Survival Alliance, International Iguana Foundation. Um, we contribute a lot to US ARC. Um, so, so some of these, as well as like different uh, universities that we, we contribute both funds and um, product and everything to for their research and understanding and things like that. Um, and a lot of zoos that uh, that we're able to contribute to. So, um, you know, I think I think that's really big and that we're able to to give to people who really know what they're doing in, in those respects and um, and are doing a lot of really good work for conservation. Uh, I think one of the roles that we play that <laughs> that gets downplayed a little bit is just trying to help make sure that people can be successful with their pets. And especially from the beginning, because when you have a connection with an animal, um, you tend to care more about their wild counterparts. You tend to care more about the environment that they're from. And then you tend to take action towards conserving that. And so I think just allowing people the accessibility of making connections with animals that they otherwise wouldn't is really, really important. And so we've put a huge emphasis on education. Um, we have an education program that we developed um, mostly for retailers. It's called ZooMed University, and it's available to, uh, to independent retailers and all of their associates so that people who are working in a pet store can really learn the basics of reptile care. Because let's face it, a lot of people that work in pet stores don't have that background information. They think, oh, it's going to be fun to go get a job in the pet shop. Um, so we wanted to come at it from uh, uh, the point of view of understanding the animal care needs, not necessarily from a product-based, but just the the basic needs of the animals. Because the more that you can learn about that from the beginning, the more you know what questions to ask and how to become more informed and how to really you know get into that research and understand the animals to be successful. And when you go to the pet store, you hope that someone there is going to give you good advice. And that isn't always the case. So we've, mm -hmm. you know, we've kind of tried to tackle that. On our website, we have a whole care and education center and are introducing a new lighting education page, heating education page to really try to drive home some of these points about understanding what the needs of all of these animals are and how you can best provide for that. Again, so that people go home, have good, positive experience, be successful with their pets and continue in the hobby and continue to care about, you know, the wild counterparts and, and the environment that they came from. Um, so that's kind of my like roundabout of like conservation. <laughs> Uh, in addition to that, we have, like I said, a large facility um, of live animals. We've been lucky enough to work with some in, uh, some great endangered species. We have yellow blotch sawback turtles coming out of our ears sometimes, you know, in the springtime. Um, we've been able to breed quite a few that then get um, uh, often tra uh, transferred to uh, different zoos and other um uh, other breeders that are working with with some of these species, so it's a. So that's a, is that a separate facility from where you are now? Nope. <laughs> oh, that's all part of, part of the same. Here. Yeah. Oh, Literally, okay, I can cool. hear him doing water changes next door. Yep. Um, and then we have a we have a greenhouse um, that is out essentially in our parking lot, but uh, but that's our, our outdoor facility. But it's all right here on this campus. And an okay, incubation that's... room that's. One wall two away, that would be at two <laughs> over. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's. It, uh, I think that's something that people don't really realize uh, about Zoomed is that there's a whole, you know, the breeding operation to it that that it has a sort of conservation tilt to it. And I do, I do think it's really important as reptile keepers that you have some, you're helping in, in, in conservation in some capacity because you know 
there is damage that's done by our hobby and we kind of have to admit that and if there's some ways that we can we can protect the, like you said actually the wild counterparts i think it's really important that uh, that that's done uh, i i had one of my one of my li- regular listeners talk about uh, or want to ask about caiman lizards because he, he i think he keeps caiman lizards at home and i, I think do you guys still have uh, a group of caiman lizards mm-hmm. yeah maybe uh, how how many do you have and, and what is it like working with that species they're wonderful we have three um we've got a pair that are outside in the greenhouse and then we've got a male another male that lives separately um we had a custom cage built that goes over one of the, is it large or extra large Waterland tubs? That the biggest tub that that is made by Waterland tubs, um, and this this cage extends um, five feet over the top of the habitat. So it's a big tall. We made some really cool uh, cork branches that kind of go throughout that. So they have a large swimming area a land area that they can, you know, go up to nest and everything on. Um, and then lots of basking opportunities. Uh, our greenhouse is something that's, um, it's really an amazing facility. Uh, actually we had, if you want to see it, there is a video done by, uh, Camp Kennan that we did a really cool, um, walkthrough of all of that. But, um, we've got UVB transmitting panels across the top of the greenhouse. So animals all have access to natural UVB. It's thermostatically controlled. Um, and over the top of the caiman lizards specifically, we have supplemental heat because they don't like to get cold. Um, but they utilize their whole habitat and we've got them all target trained. So at feeding time, I use buoys on a stick and they come over and boop that with their little, little noses and then they get their their snail or shrimp or whatever the diet item of the day is uh, fed to them. Um, so it's made them really manageable and handleable. You can take them out, hold them, manipulate them however needed, but also you can kind of, you know, control where they're going just based on their own motivation to to come over and see the target. So um, yeah, they seem like them. they're pretty intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. They're super smart. Yeah. They're really smart. Awesome. Well, is there anything that we left out today that either of you wanted to say before we officially wrap up? I think we kind of covered most things that we wanted to hit, but if there's anything that you're that's burning that you think oh, I wanted to mention this before we wrap up, you can go ahead and no pressure if there's nothing. You'd um, you'd asked about if there were any uh, products that were like in the works or coming yes, out soon, yeah, yeah, yeah. and your timing couldn't be better because uh, right now there's a, a global pet expo occurring where you know companies announce like uh, new products being launched. So that's that happened yesterday or two days ago. So um, we can share some of those products with you if you like. Yeah, please, yeah. please do. Yeah. Yeah. Like? yeah, oh yeah. yeah just real quick. Um, I'll never say no to that. <laughs> there's, uh, Ashley mentioned there's, you know, another uh, size or version of the heat projector that was uh, being worked on. So that's this dainty little 35 watt um, heat oh, cool. projector that's, you know, going to be appropriate or applicable for, you know, hatchling habitats or, you know, uh, terrariums that are, lower profile that you need to create a, a softer heat gradient for um, or you know have equipment that's you know at a closer uh, distance from the animals so that's that's what this little guy is um do you have some over there that you were that you were working on that you i've got to? oh um i i don't have it here but i have some of the packaging we are doing this tortoise yard that is a collapsible um pen that folds up flat Oops. oh, oh that's here cool. we go um, it folds flat so you can move it aside, but, uh, it'll make a really great sunning, grazing, basking, um, place for anyone who's keeping tortoises, um, especially like small species that are being housed indoors. Um, put it out on your lawn, wherever, you know, you, it's pesticide free and all of that, but let your tortoise graze and then move it as you need. Um, and the size is... Massive arms, Oh, yeah. Right? It's 63 inches um, wide by, oh gosh, 63 by 47. And it's almost two feet tall. And it does have a top that will protect against like, you know, predators. You have birds or cats or whatever. Um, there are a few solid panels to protect, to provide shade and um, wind protection and the whole thing, like there's no assembly required. It's all assembled with hinges. And so it folds completely flat. 
you know, like collapsible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so really it's cool only idea. like eight inches wide, I think, or five and a half inches wide when it's um, when it's closed up. So you can just tuck it right away. And uh, but hoping that that'll help with enrichment for tortoises, you know, exercise, grazing, basking, some natural opportunities like that for people that maybe don't have a chance to build a full outdoor yard or don't live in a place that that has that availability. Yeah, it's cool. I just, you know, just simplifying ways for people to enrich the animal's life. Like that's a very simple one. If you have a tortoise that lives his whole life in a basement and in the, even if you, even if you're like where I am, where you only have two months of the year where you could potentially do that safely, you know, that's super easy. Go throw that thing outside in the backyard and then the tortoise has a, a day in the sun. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. There's also like another bigger size of our uh, submersible filter that was uh, also announced. It's like for 40 gallon habitats. Um, so it's got a pretty high, high uh, turn up water turnover, um, 200 gallons uh, per hour. Or so, you know, more than adequate for a, you know, 40 gallon aquarium that you're keeping uh, aquatic turtles in. Um, that was another product that was announced, uh, Triple Clean 40. Um, there were a bunch of your products that got like, <laughs> all launched at uh, Global Pet. So I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, we, we're doing a 40 gallon footprint low boy tank. So uh, it's only 10 inches tall, but has, so it'll be 28 gallons, but, um, but the footprint of a 40 gallon tank. So if you have, gotcha. you know, animals that are um, real fossorial or aren't going to utilize some of that, um, that taller space, you can kind of provide a nice big footprint for them. Um, we've got another tank that's similar in size. I think it's 12 inches tall, but it has front opening doors. So again, that 40 gallon footprint. 12 inches tall with doors opening up on the front. Um, There's some new foods being launched. There's a mm -hmm. axolotl diet, a soft, like moist diet, um, pelleted formula that um, Miranda had had worked on. And a new bearded dragon food. That's right. Mm -hmm. Bearded dragon. Is that a pellet as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely want to give her a platform at some time to really talk about that one because it's going to be an awesome food. So Okay, cool. Yeah. Who's another person on our um, R and D team? There's uh, Miranda and Sam, and Miranda's uh, um, food key nutrition. focus is yeah, foods and nutrition. Mm-hmm. So awesome. These are products that like we all worked on, and you know get to get to help you know showcase or uh, reveal at the uh, at Global, and then you know you, you'd asked, so we uh, figured a good opportunity to mention it here as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing those. That's that's awesome. It's I, I'm sure it's super exciting to be able to launch and, but it's probably more rewarding to be able to you know get the idea and then work through the the concepts and test it at, at your own facility and then have it actually end up at the local pet store and then to see people using it. It's it's uh, I'm sure that's a pretty rewarding experience. Yeah. To your point, actually, I forgot to mention this about the the Repti cooler, but talking about you know seeing a product go from like a concept to inception and like on on the shelf. Um, there was uh, the person who designed that outer housing. The aesthetic was uh, an engineer student at the local university. That's like five minutes away from here. So it was like a oh, no way. 19-year-old engineer who came in for an interview, uh, worked, you know, did contract work designing the aesthetic and you know function of that product. And uh, I think he's he's graduated now. It's been a few years, but he's like, oh, I I would love to have a a product off the shelf that I could take with me into an interview and show like I'm you know. 20 years old and responsible for the external design of like this product that's out in the market. So that's really cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you both very much, Ashley and Andrea. I really appreciate this uh, hour and a half you spent with me today. And it's, it's always nice to kind of see the inner workings of, of some of these companies. Like I said, Zoomed is such an ever present brand and it's just something that's always around. So it's, as I said, it's, it sort of seems, it, could come off as being a huge corporation, big thing, but really it's a mom and pop shop that just creates these products and, and they're heavily used. Obviously, the, especially the lighting was a mainstay in our, it has been a mainstay in the hobby for such a long period of time. So it was fascinating kind of hearing the evolution and whatnot. So thank you both very much for joining me. Can, can one of you let everybody know, I mean, sort of a pointless question, but, but let everybody know where they can find more information on ZoomEd? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having us. It's really yeah, been fun. And, uh, and, and, yeah, enjoyable. Been a pleasure. Uh-huh. And uh, you can go to zoomed.com. There's lots of information there. Uh, make sure you check out the Karen Education Center up in the top menu. And that's where you're going to find um, a lot of the, the resources that we provide. So, um, so definitely check that out. Our social media. Oh, gosh, Davey, I'm sorry. I don't know all the handles. 
Yeah, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all that stuff. Uh, if you go to zoomed.com, the links for all of those are, are right there on the webpage. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's why I say it's kind of a pointless question because people should be able to find it, but you never know. But I'll make sure everything's in the show notes. Zoomed is pretty simple to, to find and obviously a big enough brand at this point where, where it's uh, very pervasive. So anyway, thank you to both very much and, and thank you for sharing the new products. I cannot wait to see those hit the market and, and announcing them here on the show was, was really awesome. So thank you so much for being here with me today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. All right, that is the end of that episode. Ashley and Andrew, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast and sharing the history of ZoomEd and, and sort of the walking us through the evolution of lighting. I thought that was fascinating. And also announcing new products on the show is really special. So I do really appreciate that. Listeners, if you are if you enjoy the episode, go share it, share it on social media. Give us a rating on, on Apple or Spotify if you're listening to us in there, a thumbs up and a subscription on YouTube if that's where you're coming to us. Thank you so much for continuing to listen to the show. I, I can, again, I can't express the gratitude that I have for people who are regularly listening to the podcast. It really does mean a lot to me. If you're looking for more information on the podcast, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. Thank you so much to customreptilehabitats.com, who is the sponsor of the podcast. That is who is responsible for these incredible enclosures behind me. And there's more of those to come. I know I've been saying that for a while. I've been slow at doing things because uh, my life is insanely busy. I have very few free moments to do things, but it will happen soon. And so the set will be completely finished. Uh, shortly i should not put a time frame on it because again things get busy but i cannot wait to to have this whole thing decked out in custom reptile habitat enclosures if you're looking for more information on them head to the show notes or the youtube description you'll find an affiliate link there if you would like to join us over at patreon you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home there you can help support the show financially that does go to paying the editing fees and the server space and the equipment and whatnot and finally is there even a finally? I think I've covered everything, actually. I think I have gone through <laughs> through all my bullet points. I don't know why. i got to make myself a list to just remember what I have to say at the end of every podcast. But thank you so much for listening, as always, and I will see you guys in the next episode. <laughs>